Hi there. This is Dr. Jess from Premier Physical Therapy, and I am here today to talk to you about lymphedema. So this is a pretty cool topic, something that not everybody has even heard of necessarily understands. So the goal for today is for us to be able to, to overall just get a better understanding of what is lymphedema and then what do we do about it? So pretty basic. Um, it's not scary and it's totally manageable. All right, so a little bit about us. Uh, the clinic is called Premier Physical Therapy. We are a uh, locally owned PT practice here in Jacksonville. Um, um, it's not, mm -hmm. let's see, hold on. Let me fix this. Show and stream. There we go. Sorry, I was not sharing my screen so you couldn't see the PowerPoint. Um, let's try again here. Okay, so we're good. You can see it. Okay. So we are a locally owned uh, physical therapy practice and we've got two locations here in Jacksonville. One's right off Beach Boulevard um, between Hodges and, Pano and uh, San Pablo and then one's out in Ponte Vedra. We treat all sorts of specialties um, in addition to orthopedics, meaning we can treat anything from head to toe plus specialties that include head and facial pain, uh, lymphedema. Um, we do oncological rehabilitation, uh, which is something else that I run here at uh, Premier. And then we do all sorts of stuff with post-surgical rehab, sports performance training. So if you want to learn more about us, check us out on our website and we're happy to, or call, call or email us and we're happy to give you some more information. But today the goal is, is to understand lymphedema. In order to do that, we need to further um, give you the backstory of what is the lymphatic system. So if we don't know the normal physiology, then it's hard to understand what can go wrong with it. Okay, so the biggest thing that you need to understand about the lymphatic system is that it's part of the circulatory system, meaning that we've got arteries, veins, and lymphatics. So the artery takes oxygenated blood and pumps it throughout your body to deliver oxygen and other nutrients to your tissues. Now, once your tissues, you know, muscles and whatnot, use those nutrients, what, the, what's left essentially is now deoxygenated blood, okay? Um, but then there also might be waste products that are a byproduct of muscle contractions. Um, there could be um, infections going on, all sorts of stuff that your body's constantly fighting because you're you're being bombarded by stuff all the time. Small viruses, uh, bacteria, all, all different things that our body's um, trained to be able to handle so we don't get sick constantly. We don't have infections constantly. We have a little scratch and our body needs to repair that and send repair cells to that area. And it doesn't turn into this huge gaping wound. So that's kind of how our cellular process happens all the time. But once those cells are delivered to the area, now they have to be picked back up. And then we've got to return those cells back to the heart because that's essentially what's gonna happen is that that's gonna come back to the bloodstream and then it becomes reoxygenated again. Now. Veins help to pick up fluid that is excess, you know, and, and is um, now this, um, just extra fluid. And the lymphatics also help to pick up this extra fluid. Now the veins are very picky. They're like, they're kind of like the little prima donnas of fluid. And they're like, we're only going to pick up the carbon dioxide, which is the byproduct of a muscle contraction. They're like, that's it. We take nobody else. You know, they're like the um, the really nice limousine highway type car. The lymphatics are like, listen, I got you, okay? Like if whoever you are, I got you, you come on in and like I will give you a ride back to where you need to go, okay? So that's the lymphatic system. What that means is that that lymphatic fluid has to be filtered. So you can't just take all this crap that's been circulating throughout your body and just dump it back into the heart without it being cleaned. So that's what makes the lymphatics different than the veins is that the lymphatic fluid has to go through lymph nodes to clean that fluid and then it can be returned back to the heart. Okay. And so the physiology of the lymphatic system is different than your venous and arterial system because of the lymph node itself. And we'll, we'll kind of further explain those lymph nodes in just a minute. Okay. 
Now, when we think of the lymphatic system, we've got different areas of the body that are all filtered through different sets of lymph nodes, okay? On this picture, you can see, and I know it's probably a little bit small, but what you see is that you've got a line going across right around the um, collarbone, okay? A line that goes down the midline of the body, and then a line that goes across where about that last rib sits, okay? Now, anything that's in the territory of this line, which includes anything from the collarbone to midline to the rib, okay, and over all filters through lymph nodes in the armpit. Anything that's midline of the body, lower abdomen and leg, all filters through lymph nodes in the groin. And the same is true for the opposite side, okay? And then anything above the collarbone midline is going to, in the head, is going to filter through lymph nodes in the neck. And the same thing for the other side. So essentially, we have these big groups of lymph nodes. We've got a big chain in the neck on either side. You've got a big chain in the armpit on either side. And you've got some big ones in the groin on either side. There's also some deep lymph nodes in the abdomen that help to filter the fluid from the abdomen itself. All right. Now, why that matters is because anything inside of the territory could be affected with swelling if we have a problem with the lymph node in that area, okay? Um, so if we think of lymphedema, it might not just be affecting the arm. So a lot of times I'll have a patient that comes in after, uh, let's say they had not a full mastectomy, but they had a lumpectomy. So they had tissue removed from one breast, but they come in and they're like, well, this is weird. Like the breast that tissue was removed from is now larger than the other side. They didn't add anything, did they? I'm like, no, 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 that's swelling. Because anything in this territory could swell. It's not just the arm. The same is true for the leg. You could have swelling into the lower abdomen. So one side of the abdomen is like hanging down and the other side isn't and the leg is swollen. And they're like, well, that's weird. Like, why is like, why does my stomach feel fuller on the side? Well, it's all part of that territory, okay? And then just understanding the normal physiology helps us to understand, oh, so that's why when something goes wrong, I have swelling in these areas that I hadn't really considered, okay? So it's not scary, it's not abnormal, it's completely normal. The other thing that exists that's in this picture that's always important to point out is these yellow lines. So the yellow lines are areas that we can use to talk in between territories. So this is where we kind of get into treatment options, okay? We do have lymphatic vessels that cross territories. That's a big deal. They do not normally function though, okay? So I have vessels that talk in between these two areas. So what that means is that if I have swelling into, let's say I have swelling into my left arm, I can use the lymph nodes on my right side to help to drain the fluid out of my left arm. So there's specific techniques and strategies that we use to do that, but using these, what we call anastomoses, can be very helpful for um, getting the fluid to what we call decongest or get that limb smaller. The same thing exists in the trunk. So let's say I have a problem in my groin and I had lymph nodes removed or I had stress to that area, then I can use lymph nodes in my armpit on the same side to try and help to drain that fluid. And then I can get that leg smaller. Okay. So these are, again, the just as, as much as we can appreciate the normal anatomy and physiology is how we use that to then drive what we do for intervention. Okay. Now that was normal. So this is all what normally exists. Now let's talk about what goes wrong. What goes wrong is a, um, a word that we use is called lymphedema, meaning swelling. It's an abnormal swelling condition. All right. And this isn't just like a post-surgical swelling. This is, this is a little bit different than that. This is a protein rich swelling because the type of fluid that is in the lymphatic system is gonna be typically have a little bit more cellular debris in it because we already talked about that the lymph vessels are the ones that are like, come on in, I'll help you. I'll give you a ride back to the heart. So this type of swelling is just a little bit different. Still swelling um, that needs to be managed though, okay? It's not necessarily just going to 
go away on its own once it's once it has started. All right, now let's talk about why does this happen? I mean, that's like, this isn't cool. I have the spelling and this isn't what I was really wanting to deal with right now. I get that, I wouldn't either. Just like, I don't wanna deal with pain or anything else. Like I just wanna go through my life and not have to deal with any of it. But then you're like, oh wait, yeah, life is never that simple. So what causes it? We've got primary lymphedema and secondary lymphedema. Primary meaning is something you were born with, is what it is. Um, <clears throat> it's a genetic developmental disorder. Um, it's not very common in the US. It does happen, but not, not very common. Second, secondary lymphedema, this is what is much more common in the US. Pretty much what typically causes true secondary lymphedema is some sort of trauma to the lymphatic system. So it could be surgery. Um, and again, most commonly it's related to cancer related treatment. This has nothing to do with any anybody doing anything wrong with cancer related surgery. This is not something that went wrong in surgery. It's because in order to stage the cancer, they have to remove a couple of lymph nodes in order to test to see if they're positive. So just like the lymphatic vessels are, they're the ones that are like, hey, like I'll pick up anything and help it get back to the heart. It's gonna be, it, the lymphatic system can be a conductor of cancer as well. So if your cancer has spread into the lymph nodes, they're then gonna have to look further for other areas of cancer that have potentially developed. And so that's when they, if, if one node is positive, they'll typically go in and test more nodes. So now let's say you had 40 lymph nodes in your armpit and one, they test one or two and they come back positive. They may end up removing 12 or 13 more, okay? And they need to know what they're dealing with. So it's nothing, to, it's nothing that um, was done incorrectly, but the result of removing those nodes to better understand the cancer is that you might end up developing lymphedema, okay? Other things that can cause it, motor vehicle accidents, sports injuries, falls, anything that could put um, damage to the lymph nodes, um, major traction stress to the lymphatic vessels, any sort of like major laceration that cuts through some of the lymphatic vessels and they never really form completely, um, scar tissue from some sort of like maybe recurrent scars or like major abdominal surgery and um, it, that scar tissue starts forming around lymph nodes or lymphatic vessels and it starts to block them. Um, <clears throat> all sorts of different things like that can also cause it, but it's typically some sort of trauma or stress to the lymphatic system. Um, lipedema is an, a, an over accumulation of what we call adipose cells, um, which are uh, fatty cells. So that's also something that can um, secondarily lead to lymphedema, which is more of a um, true swelling disorder versus a fatty um, cell disorder. So, um, <clears throat> but all of those are potential causes. That's not a complete list by any means. Now, when we think of the lymphatic system, because I always like to say, let's make it make sense. That way it's not scary. So if we think of the lymphatic system and we have what's called a transport capacity. So it's how much fluid can the lymphatic system handle at any period of time? So let's say the typical capacity of the lymphatic system is here. And how much load are we currently placing on that lymphatic system? So let's say if the capacity is here, so I can handle 10 levels, like boop, 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 10. Um, but my load commonly day to day is two. I don't really put much load on my lymphatic system, but let's say I have a fall and I have a big cut that has to heal. Boop, boop. I'm gonna put a little bit more load on that lymphatic system because I've got cells that are coming in to repair that site where I have a scratch. Well, let's say I have a surgery, boop, 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 because now I have post-surgical swelling. And I've got um, some areas that maybe I have hardware that's been put in my body or whatnot, but I'm still less than my capacity, which means that I don't have any long lasting, what we call edema or swelling, okay? So because my capacity is much higher than the load really ever will be, I never have a long-term accumulation of fluid. Now what happens when we have damage to the lymph nodes or removal of lymph nodes? My transport capacity decreases. So once I have a decrease in that capacity and I might have a load then that starts to surpass the capacity, what's left, okay, this little barrier in between, what's left is swelling. So swelling is the result because the lymphatic vessels 
combined with the efficiency of getting that fluid filtered through the lymph node is no longer able to keep up with the amount of fluid that it needs to filter. So we get this backlog of fluid. Um, and that's what leads to the limb getting larger and swollen and the, um, the everything that can happen after that. And then there's some stages that we'll go through as well. The best way I like to explain this when we think of why does this happen, okay, is imagine you're going on a highway. We've got all these lanes. I mean, think of this horrible highway. I would hate to drive that highway every day. That would be awful. But people do. Okay. Um, so every single lane must pass through a toll booth. Nobody gets to go around the toll booth. That's not fair, right? So let's say typically every single toll booth is open. It's staffed 24 seven. Okay. We've got shifts of people coming through. Everybody can go through just fine. That means my transport capacity is normal. Okay. Now let's say that I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I had to have lymph nodes removed. They removed two. They were positive. I had 10 more removed. So I had 12 removed. So now my capacity has decreased because the number of toll booths, so think of each, each lymph node as a toll booth, has now declined. So I have now closed a quarter of the toll booths at this, um, at this intersection here, okay? So if all of this traffic, the same amount of traffic, still has to go through less open toll booths, what happens is we get a backup of traffic. So we can kind of see that. Now, if we think of over time, okay, We've closed these other toll booths. Those toll booth workers are never coming back. The toll booth workers that are left are told, listen, we're kind of, you know, we're low on hiring and we're not gonna replace these people. So you don't get PTO anymore. You don't get weekends off and you don't get vacation. You just have to work harder and longer. Sorry, but that's how it is. So what can happen over time is that the toll booth workers that are left are like, this is horrible. I don't like this. And they can up and quit. Okay. And if they up and quit, they're not going to be replaced. And so that's what happens with lymphedema. If it's not managed is that we put this extra strain on the lymph nodes that are left, but if we don't give them some help, they can slowly over time start to quit. And that's when we start to get into these uh, more advanced stages of lymphedema that is preventable. We can help to prevent that from happening. We just have to be proactive and not reactive. So we can't wait until the toll booth worker has quit and they're on their way and they're gone. They're out to be like, oh, let's see if we can recover them. Um, no, it's done. Like the deed was done. So we just, at that point, we're trying to preserve what's left. Um, so the big, a big point of this talk is to say, let's be proactive instead of reactive. Let's not wait until we have all these toll booth workers quitting because we already know that we've got a quarter of them that are gone. Okay. The lymph nodes were removed. So let's support who's left so that we can continue to have the best possible management for the long term. The better we understand the physiology, physiology and anatomy, the better that we can handle the decisions that we should be making for our body in the future. Now, how I, how I kind of already prefaced a little bit is that we have these different stages of lymphedema. So stage zero means that we've had some sort of injury to the, the lymphatic system, meaning we've had some lymph nodes removed, maybe we've had a big laceration, we've had surgery that have, you know, severed lymph nodes, or um, uh, radiation has hit the nodes, or um, vessels have been cut but we don't have any visible swelling or symptoms. So what that means, if we go back to kind of the explanation is, the transport, transport capacity is less than it was, but it's still sufficient. So we still are, we're still fine. We can handle the typical day-to-day -day stress. So we're okay, but it is considered a stage zero lymphedema because your transport capacity is less than it was, okay? So this is what we call the pre-stage. Once we get into stage one is when we do have visible swelling that occurs. However, if you elevate that leg or your arm or whatever it might be, or you sleep overnight, the swelling reduces because gravity is constantly affecting our body. So if gravity is pushing down on my limbs all day long. It's going to be harder for that fluid to pump up against gravity to get back to the heart. So then when I lie down at night, 
I'm in what we call a gravity eliminated position. So it's a lot easier for everything to flow because it doesn't have to flow up against gravity. So in stage one, gravity is the, is the main effect. If you can go into a gravity eliminated position, the swelling declines, and then you're like, oh, maybe I don't have a problem. You wake up in the morning and you're like, oh, my hands, I can put my ring on and my bracelet, or I can put my shoes and socks on. And then you start going throughout your day and you're like, oh, darn it, it started again. Now my ring is tight, my bracelet is tight, my shoe isn't fitting well or whatever it might be. So that's, that's a stage one. Once we get into a stage two, it means that when you wake up in the morning, your leg is, or arm, or face, or abdomen, whatever it might be, is still big. So it has not completely reduced overnight. So at this point, this is where we're starting to get into those later stages of lymphedema, okay? So the fluid isn't coming and going as much, it's coming and staying. And so what we don't want is we don't want to just let this continue, okay? Because then we get into the stage three, which is when that swelling is no longer soft, it becomes fibrotic, which is very hard at that point to reduce. <clears throat> we can usually make some changes, but we're not gonna get the leg back down to the size of what it was. Um, and there, I mean, there is some surgical options that are, are available. Um, it's not widespread and it, it can be pretty expensive depending on if your insurance will or will not cover it. So the idea is let's just not get to that, right? Let's just not. And then if we can prevent that from happening, then you won't even have to go down that road. Um, but it doesn't mean that if you are a stage three that we can't work on helping you because there still typically is a, a, a softer component to the swelling in addition to a fibrotic component to the swelling. Um, and the softer component is what we can um, what we can decongest or move and try and get the size of that limb back down again. Um, the other thing that can happen in stage three is that we see skin related changes. So you might see discoloration of the skin, you might see growths on the skin, um, you can feel that firmness on the skin itself becomes a little bit thick, um, all sorts of all sorts of different things, not, and not all of them have to happen by any means. Um, it can easily be just like some firmness that you feel under the skin. You're like, oh wow, I feel like this spot that's kind of firm. It's like a little round circle. And um, that's, that's that fibrosis that's starting. So those are the stages and what happens. Now, what do we do about it? I mean, that's what we all wanna know. Like, okay, so this happened, I'm swollen, I had lymph nodes removed or whatever it might be. Um, what in the world do I do? So what the um, evidence-based treatment, okay, is that, that we have found that works is called complete decongestive therapy. It's a combination of treatment techniques, which includes some hands-on techniques, which include manual lymphatic drainage. So that's where we are using a series of skin stretching techniques to stimulate the lymphatic vessels to pump at a faster rate than they normally pump. And we're going to direct the fluid away from the area where the lymph nodes aren't working well, and we're gonna to go to some other areas where the lymph nodes are healthy. So if we go back to the highway scenario, we know, so we're going on the highway, two exits ahead, that's where we've got this, uh, this the big toll booth area, and a quarter of the, of the toll booths themselves are closed. What we can do is we can set up a detour, and we can say, hey, exit prior to that okay and then we're going to shoot you around to where these other toll booths are so that we can have the traffic filter through there which is going to help decrease the load on these toll booths so that's essentially what we're doing with manual lymph drainage is we're saying fluid from the arm don't actually filter through the armpit we want to come around the armpit and across and filter through the opposite side where i still have ample lymph nodes or filter down towards my groin so that's essentially what we're doing with manual lymphatic drainage. We're not just like squishing fluid out of the arm and moving it somewhere, okay? We're, we're setting up a specific detour to drain that fluid somewhere else, while at the same time, we're trying to increase the rate at which that vessel pumps, okay? So again, we're always going back to the physiology of the lymphatic system and the anatomy of the, of the lymphatic system and using that to guide our understanding of what are we going to do to treat this dysfunction, <clears throat> okay? Now, we have manual lymph drainage, so we're gonna do that. Then we're gonna do potentially some form of compression. Bandaging is, if it's pretty advanced, uh, we're, we're gonna probably go into some bandaging. Advanced meaning that we have at least a 10% involvement of the involved side. So when we take measurements of, for example, both arms, if one arm is 10% larger than the other side, we're, that's, that's a good amount of swelling. We really need to get that swelling out. 
Um, so that's when we're typically going to be trying to decide, are we already not going to bandage? Um, I don't always bandage if it's less than that because some of the other techniques alone plus exercise will, you know, clear that out and then we don't have to add the bandaging. But when it's a little bit further progressed, that's when we'll add the bandaging or some bandaging alternatives. And so bandaging is uh, what we call graded compression bandaging. So we're going to put a layer of stockinette onto the arm or leg, and then we're gonna put some padding on. So if you can see my arm, you can see that my wrist is much thinner than my forearm. That's just my muscle mass, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so what we wanna do is we want to fill this in with padding to create as much of a cylinder as possible, because that way I can ensure that I'm putting even compression on the limb itself, that I'm not putting a lot of compression here because the diameter circumference is smaller, and then as the circumference gets bigger, then the pressure is less. I've gotta be super careful about doing this safely. So we put some padding on, and then we do a series of, of bandages that are called short stretch bandages that are different than long stretch. So this is not ACE bandages. That's not safe to wear long term. Short stretch bandages put a lower pressure onto the area. But then we do a series of the bandages sequentially. So that makes it, it's a long term pressure. So you would have this on for a couple of days. And then as you move and function with this on, it's going to create a nice safe amount of pressure to help to decongest that limb. Okay, so that's graded compression bandaging. The other thing that we do is called skin care. All right. If we think of having a swollen area okay so i've got my artery that's supposed to be delivering nutrients to my skin so typically there's a what we call diffusion distance so if my artery is normally here and my skin is here that distance is not very far all right so those little nutrients do, 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 get to the skin and then the skin is nice and healthy the cells are um, having that constant repair process because we're constantly sloughing off the top layer of skin. So we're constantly having to bring new skin up. That's, you know, that's why we have dust around the house. Now, when you have swelling, uh-oh, the diffusion distance is now further. So I've got my little my little cells that are coming up to my skin, but they might get lost along the way. So now my skin, even though I'm swollen, is very dry and it feels brittle and it scratches easily or I get wounds easily or potentially I'm a high risk of infection like cellulitis. So we really want this diffusion distance to be less, which is why we do manual lymph drainage and bandage to get that swelling down. But we also have to make sure that we're taking care of this top layer of skin from the outside because we know from the inside we're not getting the amount of care that we typically should. So what kind of soaps we use, what kind of lotions we use, all of that is very, very important, okay? And then the last thing that we do in complete decongestive therapy are exercises. So when we compress our muscles and we activate them, they put pressure against the veins. So that can help tie into our venous system to help with some of the fluid return back to the heart. The other thing is that we want to make sure that we're not compressing any area that's already maybe has some damage like lymph nodes removed. So if I've got scar tissue or I've got tightness in my pec that's compressing through the front of my shoulder, well, that's going to create um, more difficulty for the lymphatic fluid to, to filter through the nodes in the armpit. So the more I can kind of open that shoulder up, now I'm going to have just a healthier flow in general. So we use exercise in multiple ways, not only to open up areas that maybe have been compressed, but also to help get some compression against the veins for fluid return. As far as treatment goes, when we go in, when we get out of that phase of decongesting, then we get into the phase of maintaining. So lymphedema is currently non-curable. So that means it's a chronic condition, just like let's say diabetes. So if you are taking metformin for your diabetes because we've got some um, issues with your pancreas not being able to process like it's supposed to, um, you have to constantly think about that for the rest of your life. It doesn't just like poof go away. So lymphedema is the same way. Once we have this as a dysfunction, it doesn't just resolve and go back to normal. So remember those lymph nodes that were removed are removed, they're gone. So we have to think about long-term what do we do to keep the health of your lymphatic system. So what we do with this is we use garments. We use compression garments for the arms or for the legs, for the face, and then that way we can keep the limb, the limb size down. 
Other things that we use might be, instead of us doing manual lymph drainage, we might be teaching you to do self manual lymph drainage. We might use a pump to help with keeping that lymphatic fluid flowing. Um, we will probably give you some sort of a home program to keep everything moving like it's supposed to. And then also have you continue with proper skin care. So now you've got this phase of treatment where we're trying to get everything under control, but then we're also doing a ton of education to teach you, okay, long-term, now what do I do? How do I keep this down? And the compliance with this phase two is really ultimately what helps you not progress through the stages. All right, now we're always gonna open up to questions at the end. Um, you can um, you know, write them in and if there's none, that's totally fine. Um, but I will say that if there's any, any time that you're like, I don't really know what this is and maybe I'm kind of confused. Should I talk to my doctor? Should I, you can always reach out to your physician and ask them um, what they think, but you can always also email us. You can shoot um, myself an email, it's super easy, jess at pptjacks.com. Um, we'll write that in the comment section so that way it's, you know, you don't have to memorize it. And um, you can call the clinic. So um, that's kind of the numbers right there at the bottom of your screen. You can call the clinic and then we can try and give you a call back. Um, or you can come in for a treatment, right? You can come in for an evaluation and say, what do you think? Do you think you can help me with my swelling? And we'll either say yes or no. <laughs> uh, we're never going to take on a patient that is presenting with either red flags or things just aren't adding up and it's like, hmm, this isn't presenting like a typical lymphedema. We might have something else going on that's creating swelling. All sorts of different things can happen. It could be associated with congestive heart failure. We could have um, what's called a, um, a blood clot in the leg. Okay, it's a DVT. So there's things that we're constantly gonna be screening for in the evaluation process to ensure that it's safe to continue and that the diagnosis is lymphedema and that it's not something else that's creating swelling, all right? So please don't hesitate to reach out, um, talk to your doctor, talk to other people in your life, but please don't just let swelling continue. Swelling is a sign that something is not finding a homeostasis. Something isn't able to respond appropriately, and so your body needs some sort of help, whatever it might be, all right? Um, all right, well, I appreciate you watching, and I will hopefully see you all soon. Okay.